uh, dear speakers, guests, colleagues, and students. And today, uh, I'm very pleased to chair this uh, research seminar for under the Research Institute for Intelligent Wearable Systems. And today's topic is on intelligent wearable electronics for healthcare. Um, my name is Jin Kai, a professor at the uh, Health Technology and Informatics Department. And uh, I will share the session today. And we have three distinguished speakers today, uh, Dr. Chris Ma, and Dr. Ali Fu and Dr. Michael Merchant. Okay, I will introduce them one by one. And our first speaker is Dr. Chris Ma. And she's currently a assistant professor in the Department of Biomedical Engineering at Poly U. And her topic today is smart inflow system to improve balance and prevent falls. A very brief bio for Dr. Ma. And so um, she has served as a lecturer and later promoted to assistant professor in uh, prosthetics and also ticks at the Department of Rehabilitation, uh, Zhongping University before she joined Paul U in 2020. And she received her PhD from Faculty of Engineering at Hong Kong Polytechnic University in 2018. Her research topics focus on the comprehensive monitor, evaluation, uh, improvement of posture, balance, and gait, uh, mechanism and prevention of slips and falls, and promotion of physical activity. Okay, uh, without further ado, uh, Dr. Ma, please. Okay, uh, thank you, Professor Tsai, for your kind invitation. Uh, let me share my screen first. Okay, uh, so as introduced by Professor Tsai, today I will mainly uh, introduce some of our research work on uh, developing and also researching some smart cell systems to improve violence and prevent force over the past few years. Uh, well, actually, uh, Professor Tsai has already uh, introduced me. Uh, I was major in prosthetics and orthotics uh, for my undergraduate study, and I have also completed my internship at West China Hospital uh, from 2008 to 2012 and after which I have been working as a certified prosthetist and orthotist at China Rehabilitation Research Center from 2012 and to 2013 before uh, pursuing my PhD study at Poly U, uh, during which I have also been a visiting research scholar at uh, University of Michigan. And then after my PhD graduation, I went to uh, Sweden to serve as a lecturer, literary assistant professor uh, in prosthetics and orthotics. And in 2020, I came back at Poly U uh, as an assistant professor. So this is my brief uh, working and clinical uh, experience. Okay, uh, so now let's move on to today's topic about the falls. As we all know, falls have been a major public uh, problems. It, I can lead to severe physical and psychological trauma, enormous medical expense, and also high rate of mortality. So what about some statistics? Well, from the uh, local results, we can see that in, there is an increased trend of death and also hospitalization due to force uh, back in the past decade in Hong Kong. So this is why we really want to work on these uh, major and severe issues and try to prevent force. So what, are, what is the uh, common practice currently in Hong Kong or in the other parts of the country? We can see that uh, in general, we have some full prevention clinics and also some screening programs where we can assess the risk of force of people uh, who are prone to falls and provide some advice and also training programs. The issues of such kind of practice is that uh, they are adopted or they are introduced after falls. What if we want to prevent falls uh, before it actually happens? 
And this leads to another practice where we can have some balance training programs uh, to improve the balance of the different kind of individuals and prevent force. However, from these uh, figures, we can see that uh, either the face-to-face -face balance training approaches or using some assistive devices have the limitations that it demands for huge amount of manpower uh, which is already in short in Hong Kong and also other parts of the uh, of the world, and also for the conventional uh, balance training devices such like uh, VR and also some balance board are very cumbersome, and it is difficult for us or for the patients and older adults to travel to the uh, clinics or rehabilitation centers to receive uh, professional trainings. So this is why it came to me that maybe we can develop some wearable uh, systems to improve balance and also prevent falls of older people and uh, patients. Okay. So this is a brief illustration uh, about this topic. It is actually what I have been doing for my PhD study. Uh, so in general, as I mentioned, for the sequence or the consequences of the falls have been very significant. And there are several risk factors that can cause force, including uh, accident, muscle weakness, et cetera. And among all these risk factors, the balance and gait disorders have been the second leading cause of force, just comes after the accident. The balance and gait uh, disorders can be caused by uh, proprioceptive, visual, and also vestibular sensory impairments and for the proprioceptive sensation. The foot tactile sensation has been very important uh, in maintaining of balance because the plantar surface or the underneath surface or the bottom of our foot kept intact with the ground, which it can sense various uh, information about the uh, ground and, and also the environmental uh, factors that are relating to force. So if we can improve the tactile sensation, maybe we will be able to improve the balance and gait and thereby uh, prevent falls. So this is my hypothesis on this topic. And we have also developed a series of wearable feedback devices that can improve the static standing balance, uh, the standing balance on the perturbation and also improve the walking pattern or the gait of different populations. Uh, and this will be introduced uh, in today's seminar. I will introduce each of the study one by one, uh, as well as a brief introduction of some of our ongoing work. Okay, so let's start with the most simple one, uh, which is about the static posture stability. So as you can imagine, if we are standing, uh, our, the, our body will have to uh, we are keep moving from time to time. And if we look at the center of mass, the projection on the ground will, its projection on the ground will be a uh, center of pressure. So if our body kept moving uh, around, even if it is a very small amount of movement, there will be a area of the center of pressure, which we usually uh, define as the three area. So we can imagine that if there is larger movement of our body, the sphere area of the center of pressure will be larger. And this usually indicates uh, less posture stability and increased posture sway, which is an important indicator of high risk of force. Okay, so this is some background information. And to deal with this issue, uh, we have developed a very simple variable uh, vibrotactile biofeedback system. And the concept is very simple. So we have put a total of six four sensors uh, on the, the left and right foot. So on each side, there will be three four sensors putting at the first and fifth metatarsal head as well as the heels, okay? So as I mentioned, uh, if our body move forward, then the center of pressure will also move forward. And we can imagine that the plantar force, uh, the same force, the uh, four sensors at the uh, front part of our foot will 
be uh, detect and increased uh, false values. And the four sensors over here will detect a reduced false uh, values, okay? So whenever uh, the system detected an increased four sensors at the four foot, the, there will be a vibrator at the frontal part of our trunk will be activated to remind the users to move backward, okay? And this will also uh, applies for the rest of the body parts. So we have four vibrators put in at the anterior, posterior, left, and right side of the upper trunk of participants. Uh, participants. And whenever the posture sway uh, to the front or anterior, posterior, left, and right side is too large, a vibrator will be activated to remind the users to move uh, to the opposite in uh, to the opposite direction. And this is the basic concept of this uh, device. And we have, con we have recruited 30 healthy young and older adults to test. And we has, have also found that uh, by comparing the conditions of turning off and also turning on the uh, bar feedback system, uh, if we provide this kind of feedback information, the three area of the center of pressure will be significantly reduced in users, which indicates the improvement of the steady posture stability. Okay. Uh, but we, we all understand that actually most of falls will not happen during static standing uh, con conditions. And most falls will happen in dynamic situations. This is why for the second study, we would like to tackle more challenging tasks. And for this study, we have developed a moving platform that can suddenly accelerate uh, anterior, posterior to the left and also to the left directions. And we refer to this platform as a uh, balance perturbation platform and it, and it can provide a translational balance perturb perturbation. So the development of this system uh, is to mimic the, consider the situations where we are standing in a bus, in MTR, or in a ship that suddenly accelerates and also decelerates. And for the wearable feedback system, it is uh, kind of similar to the first study, except that we are uh, reduce, we reduce the number of four sensors on the plantar surface of the foot, and we only put four sensors at the first metatarsal heads and also the heels of the left and right foot. And we have uh, use the false values measured on the left and right uh, first metal head to indicate the posture sweep to the uh, anterior position. And also we average the false uh, values captured at the first, first metal head and also heels of the left foot to indicate the uh, posture sweep to the left direction. And this also applies to the rest of the four directions. So to similarly, if the force values at the um, to the anterior or to forward uh, direction is too large, and vibrator at the anterior part of the upper trunk will be act activated to remind the uh, users to move backward. So this is the design concept of the uh, second smiling cell system. Okay. And here are some uh, results. So we can imagine if the moving platform moves forward, our body or the center of mass will move uh, backward relatively to this moving platform due to inertia. And uh, it will uh, reach the maximal posture uh, displacement or center of mass displacement before starting to resist this perturbation and try to move uh, forward, move back forward, okay? So this maximum center of mass uh, displacement is defined as S max one in this uh, study. And then when uh, upon our study starts, uh, when our study starts to react to this moving uh, perturbation, it will uh, eventually, it will move together or with the same speed of this moving platform to reach a new posture equilibrium 
And this second uh, displacement of the center of mass is defined as S max two in this study. And the time of uh, reaching the S max one is uh, uh, defined as TP. It is indicates the reaction time where our body started to react to the uh, perturbation and starts to uh, return to its to a new balance. And the time between S max one and mass S max two is defined as T uh, recovery, which indicates the recovery time of our body. So for this figure, the red lines indicate the conditions where the uh, system is turned on, which means the uh, subjects can receive the vibrator tactile by feedback on the upper trunk. And the blue lines indicate the conditions of uh, system off where the subjects or the participants need to rely on themselves to adjust their uh, body uh, posture. And the results indicate that uh, by turning on the system or by delivering the feedback uh, close to the participants, the S max one or the maximum, maximal center of mass displacement will be significantly reduced and the amount is larger than 10%. We have also found that the T peak or the recurve reaction time uh, to resist this sudden balance perturbation has also significantly reduced in all four directions of forward, backward, uh, to the left and to the right directions. So this further supports that this mining source system can improve our, uh, uh, not only re improve our reaction time, but also reduce the maximal center of mass displacement, which indicates that uh, the posture balance under perturbations is also improved. So all the previous two studies um, have been focused on the standing situations. What about uh, walking situations? And more important, how it will it affect the patterns of patients? Because as I mentioned, I have been working in a rehabilitation center and also hospitals before my PhD study. And I really want to address the problems of patients so this is why for the third study, we focused on the patients with stroke. So uh, this figure shows the uh, posture of the foot of a patient with stroke. And we know that for patients with stroke, they, for the affected side, they commonly walked with this foot uh, inversion deformity. And this is a very severe uh, deformity for this group of patients. Firstly, with this kind of abnormal foot posture, it will lead to excessive uh, foot pressure at the lateral side of the foot compared to the medial side. And if this kind of deformity is not corrected, a flexible deformity will become a fixed deformity, which will lead to more uh, orthopedic issues, uh, such as skin damage and also uh, arthritis in patients with stroke. Okay, so this is why. Um, for the third study, we want to focus on this foot inversion deformity uh, and try to correct it with the spine cell system. So for this third study, uh, we have further simplified the uh, system. We only put two full sensors underneath the first and also the fifth metatarsal heads of the affected side. And whenever the uh, plantar force at the medial side is less than 50% of the lateral side. A vibrator at the wrist will be activated to remind the patients to put more pressure on the medial forward side. Okay, so it is very simple. And the, uh, for this side, this side of the system, it is a wireless one, and the communication uh, is via, was via Bluetooth. So this figure shows a prototype of this smiling cell uh, system. And we have computed the uh, plantar foot pressure distribution of using this system with and without turning on the feedback. So for this figure, the uh, black lines indicate the plantar foot distribution of the affected side, or which means where there is a abnormal foot inversion deformity. And the gray lines 
indicates the condition uh, or the data of the unaffected side or the rather healthy side. The dashed lines indicate the conditions of without any biofeedback, and the uh, solid lines indicate the condition of turning on the biofeedback. So by, by uh, studying the foot, plantar foot uh, pressure distribution of uh, uh, patients with stroke, we found that turning on the system could significantly increase the plantar force of the medial forefoot. We can see that uh, if we look at the, the uh, dashed lines, we can see that before or without turning on the system, the uh, plantar force of the medial forefoot is significantly less than the uninfected side, where turning on the system could increase uh, this data. And the difference between the affected side and the unaffected side have also been significantly reduced by turning on the uh, well, by turning on this system. Uh, this pattern could, was also observed in the medial uh, midfoot. Okay, so this supports that the uh, this study or this system could improve the plantar pressure distribution uh, of patients with stroke. We have also looked at the three-dimensional uh, kinematic data of the patients. So for this figure, uh, again, if we look at the fully inversion and inversion uh, angles, we can see that this system could significantly reduce the fully inversion of the affected side. What about the unaffected side? We have also found that the compensation of the unaffected side uh, have also been reduced indicates that by uh, correcting this foot deformity, the compensations of the unaffected side will also be induced. Uh, some background information is that for patients with stroke, this, due to this impairment, the, their unaffected side or their healthy side need to compensate, um, which may cause uh, excessive usage of the unimportant uh, of the healthy side and lead to some issues. So it would be uh, very helpful if we can reduce the compensation of the unaffected side, okay? So uh, for these three studies, as you can see that we have re rely on the four sensors. So you may want to ask, what about the other type of sensors? Could we uh, use angles to, 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 to develop this kind of smart insert system? And the answer is yes. And this is uh, the first study that we have uh, worked on. So a background information is that uh, there have been studies showing that during, uh, during walking, uh, there is an angle called the foot flow counter angle, uh, which means which is the angle between our foot and also the ground during the hill strike. Okay. And there have been some studies found that if this foot flow counter angle uh, is larger than 20 degrees, there will be higher risk of slips in older people and also in other uh, participant populations. Okay. We, so this is why for the fourth study, we would like to see if we can use this kind of smart or system to train uh, the foot angles. And we don't want this foot flow angle to be too small because if the angle is too small, there may, it may cause uh, issues of trips. So for this fourth study, we have uh, uh, we have set a desired foot flow counter angle range, which is between ten to twenty degrees. And if the uh, the measured average foot flow counter angle of two steps is larger than twenty degrees, a high tone uh, of verbal cues will be provided to the patients to uh, reduce this angle. And if the foot flow counter angle is less than 10 degrees, a low tone will be provided to the users to improve or to enlarge the foot flow counter angle, okay? And for this figure, uh, it shows the uh, exact foot flow counter angle of one participant in different conditions, okay? So for the right ones, it indicates the baseline uh, condition where the subject did not, where is, is the original or the natural condition of the users. And for the second condition uh, is treadmill walking with verbal instruction. Uh, this is to simulate the conditions that in clinical practice, some of 
physical therapists will verbally uh, instruct the patients to adjust their gait patterns, okay? And followed by the verbal instruction uh, situation, there are four sessions of treadmill trainings where the, uh, this auditory uh, feedback will be turned on for the users to remind them to adjust their uh, foot flow counter angles during walking. And for the last condition, it is the post training condition where the foot flow, where the feedback was switched off. So the participants will not receive any clues on their foot flow counter angle. And this is to study whether we have some um, retaining effect. And from this figure, we can see that there is a trend that by using this uh, smart insult system or by, or by providing feedback to the users, the percentage of the foot flow counter angle that is within the uh, desirable range will be significantly uh, reduced. And it is also will be significantly improved. It is also encouraging to observe that this kind of uh, positive effect can also return after a short period of training. And we hope this system could uh, be further developed to reduce the risk of force of different populations. And similarly, we have also observed some uh, interesting kinetic data uh, regard which uh, on these participants' adaptations of using this um, smart wearable system, okay? Uh, so this briefly introduced our previous work. And as you can see, this is actually based on the previous literatures. So the studies show that this uh, smart insult system is helpful, but how about uh, the users? Like we propose that, okay, we, uh, we have a new approach uh, that by supplementing the foot sensory input, can you improve the static and dynamic balance as well as the walking patterns of healthy young and older adults, as well as some patients with stroke. But how about the users, uh, like for the older adults and also the patients, are they, are they really willing to use this kind of devices? We don't know, okay? So this is why uh, at the end of my PhD study, we have conduct some interviews I think some of you may also know that PolyU has a LLP uh, project or program that is supporting this kind of uh, entrepreneurial project. So with the support of the LLP program, we have conducted uh, more than 200 interviews and questionnaires uh, with the older people, uh, patients with stroke, their caregivers and family members, as well as some healthcare professionals and distribution channels of uh, healthcare related products. And we have also identified there have been huge demands of uh, this kind of devices in Hong Kong and mainland China. Uh, so this is why we would like to continue this study. And the, here is some of the latest development of uh, this work. So upon uh, validating that both four sensors and initial measurement units can uh, feedback the foot motion and balance. Uh, we have developed a new set of system that have both four sensors and IMUs at both the left and right foot. This kind of data uh, can be uploaded to a smartphone by Bluetooth. And the, uh, uh, the, and the smartphone can also provide the vibration or auditory feedback to the users during the trainings. They will it, it is also capable of uploading this kind of data uh, to cloud via Wi-Fi, okay? So uh, by using servers, uh, we can access the data on different kind of user inter interfaces, interface installed on our laptop, uh, tablet, or smartphone. And we are hoping that uh, if we can collect data of a uh, large number of participants, we will be able to do some uh, big data analytics and be able to recognize uh, the patterns of different individuals to provide some customized or individualized trainings. Okay, uh, so this is a uh, illustration of the system. Okay, uh, and this is a collection of data uh, back in 2012 and 19, where my colleague was 
uh, capturing the foot pattern of a patient in Hong Kong and I was in Sweden. And you can see that uh, simultaneously, I was able uh, to, uh, to look at the data when the data was collected remotely. And we were hoping that this might provide the colleagues of therapists with the option of working from a distance. And if you remember, if you remember I mentioned this was our uh, thought back in 2019. And then the pandemic started. We, are, we found that this kind of uh, devices promote the telehealth or tele-rehabilitation is really needed. And we're hoping we can continue this kind of research uh, to address the needs. Uh, we hope we can use this kind of smart insult system to not only to monitor the daily activities of uh, older people and also patients, but also to uh, provide some trainings and improve their balance in different kind of activities. Okay, uh, so this briefly uh, introduce our research work on this kind of smart insult systems. We started with a very simple task of improving the static posture stability. And after years of uh, efforts, now we are developing a new set of smart insult systems. And we hope eventually we will be able to improve balance and more importantly, improve the quality of life of different populations. Okay, uh, thank you for your attention. I think I have uh, just completed any questions. Hi, thank you, Dr. Ma, for your excellent talk. Um, all right, so thank you. So uh, in view of the time, maybe we can uh, give you a couple of minutes answering, uh, there's a question in the chat. Yeah, sure. Uh, let me see. Yes, uh, there is a question about the insole system and force pit. Uh, well, for the force pit, I think it is a golden standard for measuring the ground reaction force or the plantar uh, force over the past years the measurement has been very uh, precise and reliable for the force piece. But the issue is that it is usually uh, implemented on a floor or ground, which means it is not wearable. So this kind of force piece can, also, can only be used in indoor environment. Well, for the insoles, uh, we were hoping we can use it in uh, outdoor environment and also in more uh, complex environments. So this is the major uh, advantages and disadvantages uh, as far as my, I, I understand. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ma. And so, uh, Professor Tao, do you have any questions or comments? Oh, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Ma. Uh, that, that was excellent talk. And uh, the challenge for, for this kind of uh, intervention, um, have you met such a problem with the speed uh, because you have a sensor, then you have the actuator actually working uh, immediately after that sensing signal. Then the, the time delay in this, if somebody is uh, moving fast and uh, certainly slip, and would that be possible to catch up? Yeah, that's exactly. So uh, for this kind of device, uh, my, or our major target is to, imp to improve balance. Uh, so far, we cannot use this kind of device to prevent slips or falls when it is about to happen. We can just use it to monitor some patterns that has a uh, high, higher risk of falls and to remind the users we cannot prevent, prevent falls directly, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. Um, and also another sharing about the speed issue is that for the false study, we have tried to study uh, the users graph feedback. And we have also found that if we provide feedback every step to the, to the users, every step, actually the improvement was not quite good. It means that these users can be confused if we uh, provide the uh, feedback too frequently. And we found that if we provide feedback every one step, every two steps or every three steps, actually providing feedback every two steps provided the best 
uh, treatment outcomes. So this is something for you to consider. Sometimes uh, we may not only need to focus on the device part, but also focus on the user's part to improve the development. So just some of my uh, experience. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much for your suggestions. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so maybe we take another question. Uh, sorry, uh, Dr. Wu. Um, there's another question in the chat. Uh, Uh, yes, for this one, uh, it, it's asking about the clinical outcomes. Unfortunately, due to the pandemic, we were not able to test this kind of device uh, in clinics, in nursing homes. We were hoping after the pandemic, we can have some uh, clinical trials to, to evaluate the our clinical outcomes. Okay. So after now, I, I, I may not be able to answer this question. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Okay. All right. So, so once again, uh, thank you, Dr. Ma, for your excellent talk and, and, and answering the questions. Thank you. So we'll, we'll move on to the next speaker. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks. So uh, our next speaker is Dr. Um, Ali Fu. And uh, Dr. Fu is currently the Senior Technical Manager at Nano and Advanced Materials Institute, or in short, uh, NAMI. Um, focus on the development of printed electronics, battery sensor technology, and electronic packaging materials. And Dr. Fu has earned uh, her PhD in material science and engineering from University of Michigan and a bachelor's degree from Tsinghua University. Uh, prior to joining uh, NAMI, Dr. Fu was director of technology at Advanced Micro Fabrication Equipment in cooperation and lead the development of CVD equipment for semiconductor industry. Dr. Fu also spent five years with applied materials where she uh, responsible for the CVD process development at Waffer uh, Fab. So her presentation topic today is uh, NAMI sensing technologies for healthcare applications. So Dr. Fu, please. Okay. Thank you for the introduction, Dr. Tsai. Uh, yeah, I'm Ellie. Um, I, uh, a brief introduction was given earlier by Dr. Tsai. Um, I worked in uh, semiconductor industry after my graduation and uh, later on moved to Hong Kong and focusing on material research. Uh, so I've been with NAMI for uh, like over 10 years or so. A brief introduction of NAMI uh, NAMI was a material research institute established in 2006. So we focus on uh, application-oriented research, so mostly by uh, market-driven. Um, the way we run over here is uh, every year we have several rounds of project vetting and then incubate uh, uh, total annual in investment uh, on R&D for like around over 200 million or so. So we have uh, over 250 technical staffs with some plus some, uh, you know, operational staff. And we have a huge lab presence over here in Science Park and uh, quite uh, a lot of equipment and the facility over here. So for NAMI, we mainly focusing on material development and we are divided into five different areas. Um, one is on healthcare. So that's focusing on biomaterials, some healthcare uh, related materials or so. And the second one is, is on construction materials. The third one is on uh, environmental materials, mainly on air, water, or other waste recycling or so. And the fourth one is on energy, you know, on nano generator and uh, nano sponge or stuff like that. And I belong to over here. Currently, I'm in charge of electronics materials. We focus on battery uh, development, thermal management development for device packaging and the heat dissipation. Uh, we also work on printed sensor sensing technologies. So that's what I'm talking about. I will present it today. And we have also other functioning materials for electronics. 
So that's a very brief introduction of NAMI. And uh, today I will briefly introduce several uh, technologies we are working on right now. And uh, the first one is the pressure sensor. Um, Dr. Ma earlier uh, used the pressure sensor in his in her study. So we focus on the development of the device itself. So I will uh, talk about it uh, later in the next few slides. And we also have a flexible IoT temperature patch for continuous temperature monitoring. Uh, if I have time, I will also briefly talk about the uh, transistor sensors we are working on for bio and chemical applications. Um, so for pressure sensor, uh, the mainly it's measuring the force or pressure during its operations. Um, in order to measure pressure, you know, you have to look at all the applications from very low pressure to high pressure. Uh, related with human being and the healthcare, it normally it's in the range of low pressure to medium pressure also. So for health monitoring through uh, body weight or uh, relevant, it's uh, focusing on this one. So for this application, we use a resistive pressure sensor uh, to realize uh, its application. And for lower uh, pressure, we use a capacitive pressure sensor so it can detect a very low pressure. And uh, these two areas can cover most of the pressure or force application areas. So first is the resistive tactile sensor. Uh, we use a printing method and uh, the material is uh, developed by ourselves. So we uh, develop the materials into inks and they use a screen printing method to fabricate the sensor. Uh, the sensor could be fabricated as a single sensor, like over here, a small one. Uh, Dr. Ma earlier used three or two different uh, small sensors to detect the pressure at different locations. So we can print these sensors easily. And on top of those single sensors, we can also print multiple sensors together. That means rows and the columns of electrodes are aligned on the substrate and in between the sensing material. Uh, in this way, uh, we can fabricate hundreds of sensors on, uh, on the same substrate. Uh, so the benefit of using a sensor array is it can visualize the sen uh, force change. Uh, so for, in uh, for a single sensor, uh, each sensor has a correlation between the pressure or force because um, if it's the same area, uh, pressure and force are the same thing. And uh, we can measure the conductance or resistance of the material. And it has a relationship between the resistance, conductance, and the pressure. So it has a near linear relationship. So by measuring the um, conductance, we can, uh, we can get the pressure value or force value based on the pressure. And this uh, device is uh, normally very uh, reliable. We press the full. Here, I only show the results for about 50,000, but in our lab, we try more than 1 million testing and it's still a similar performance. So, very reliable, even for, you know, uh, insole or other repeat pressing applications should be uh, very doable. Um, the advantage of using a sensor mat is it can visually give you a map or pattern for the pressure distribution. For instance, here, uh, we have a mat to display a footprint. If one person steps on this uh, mat, uh, you can clearly see a um, footprint. Uh, you can identify the high, uh, high pressure or high force area, and you can visually see where is the high pressure area. And uh, here uh, in the image, the red area normally it shows the high pressure area. So this person, when we took the footprint, um, is um, force on the heel is uh, higher. And this is a normal uh, footprint. If someone has a flat feet, and then you can see this area will become more yellow or red. So you uh, instead of using uh, a single sensor to look at the data in limited area, we can visualize the whole area. And uh, certain uh, industrial partners are also looking into, you know, 
uh, uh, put several pieces of these mats or many pieces of these mats together. So when you run or when you walk, you can visualize how the footprint changes, how it will affect uh, your, you know, your training or so. So anyway, it's uh, very useful for gait analysis. Um, so this is a, a sensor mat. I have a, a brief video maybe you can show better. Podiatry analysis is usually done to collect useful information for selecting comfortable footwear and evaluating sports performance. However, traditional analyzing systems, such as optical scanner, are expensive, bulky, and not easy to move around. It can only be installed at fixed location in clinics or retail shops. NAMI has developed a highly flexible, responsive, and portable pressure sensor mat for gait scan by screen printed pressure sensor array. NAMI's printed pressure sensor array consists of flexible polymer substrates and pressure sensitive materials with sandwich structure to achieve piezo resistive characteristic. By using screen printing technology, large number of sensor pixels can be printed simultaneously. Two substrates with printed electrode and piezo-resistive materials are laminated with each other in 90 degrees to form a high-resolution sensor array. The array can be designed with desired shape and size to fit specific needs. NAMI's printed sensor array is highly flexible for better conformity to foot for instant and accurate scanning. With the newly formulated sensitive component, the pressure sensor shows fast response to a wide pressure range from 2 kilopascals to 880 kilopascals with responsive time of less than 1.6 milliseconds. The sensor can provide instant scanning and real-time Oh, sorry. ...size to fit specific needs. NAMI's printed sensor array is highly flexible for better conformity to foot for instant and accurate scanning. With the newly formulated sensitive component, the pressure sensor shows fast response to a wide pressure range from 2 kilopascals to 880 kilopascals with responsive time of less than 1.6 milliseconds. The sensor can provide instant scanning and real-time monitoring of contour distribution. It also shows repeatable performance after thousands times of pressing. This thin and flexible sensor mat is integrated with Bluetooth module for wireless data transmission to mobile device. The product is portable and easy to set up at any location for data collection. The pressure sensor mat for gait scan can be used to provide podiatry analysis such as arch height, over pronation, under pronation and high pressure area. It is also useful for monitoring sports performance by observing asymmetry during exercise. The sensor array technology can be further developed to produce shoe insole for pressure contour monitoring. This portable and flexible pressure sensor mat for gait scan contributes greatly to ensure foot health as well as improving athletic performance. Okay, so this is uh, um, <clears throat> the printed sensor. And uh, during our collaboration with industrial partners, uh, some say uh, the printed sensor printed on plastic foils. Sometimes, you know, it's flexible, but uh, uh, sometimes does not conform well to a 3D, 3D curvature of the surface. So we looked at their, uh, uh, you know, requirements. So we come up with uh, uh, similar sensors, but with different materials. This time, uh, we use the textile as a substrate and the material to fabricate the sensor. So the function is the same. You know, it can display a shape. By using textile, it can conform to curvature the surface very well. So it's very useful for like a chair mat, a bed mat, or stuff like that. So here is a, a demo to show the sensor mat itself. So the fabricated sensor mat is um, similar to other fabric, uh, you know, product. Uh, the electrodes are woven onto the fabric and uh, function as the electrode for the sensor. Uh, the sensing layer is uh, sandwiched in between two layers of 
uh, uh, you know, electro the sheet. So it, if you put on a, to a soft a chair mat or other sports mat or so, it can clearly give you, you know, the indication or the mapping of pressure distribution. So this material, uh, the sensor based on this material is very useful for those applications that requires, uh, you know, conforming to a curvature the surface. Yeah, so the performance always is uh, similar, you know, it still has a correlation between measured resistance and the measured force. So this is for special applications. And for resistive sensor, actually, we actually measure uh, pressure over 20 kPa or so. Uh, for application below 20 kPa or so, we have to go with another type of sensor uh, because resistive sensor, when you measure at a low pressure, it's not that accurate and the variation is a bit larger. So we use the capacitive sensor. Um, from its name, you can see uh, the capacitive sensor, the measured value of the capacitance. So um, the structure is also a sandwiched structure. You know, you have two sheets of electrode and in between, uh, right now in the between, the material is replaced with a dielectric layer. Um, in the market, most of people, you know, product, the dielectric layer uh, is a blank layer. That means um, it's covering the whole surface for the sensor. Um, by using such kind of pattern, you know, normally you cannot uh, be able to detect a very small force. Um, in order to improve the performance in low pressure, uh, we use the nano imprinting method to pattern the dielectric layer. So essentially, the effective area or the contact area is reduced with the reduction of the contact area. You know, force per unit area increase. Then it can cause more deformation of this material, and then the sensitivity can increase. So this is a typical pattern we use. We micro pattern this uh, layer and use half dome or, or, or other shapes to improve the uh, sensitivity um, for small force application. So with the sensor fabricator, we can normally fabricate into a few millimeter to even one centimeter or even larger areas. So by measuring the capacitance change, we can get the force applied to this sensor. And uh, I have a short video over here to show, to measure the um, pulse. Um, you know, during pulse uh, on the wrist, the pressure change is quite small. By using this very sensitive capacitive sensor, you can see the pulse pattern can be shown uh, clearly. So it can be used to monitor uh, for certain applications. Yeah, and we also developed the um, APP, you know, a mobile phone for this applications. So everything can be wirelessly transmitted to mobile phone for, uh, for health uh, monitoring. Yeah, so this is a capacitive sensor application. And this capacitive sensor can also be used for robot applications. If I put a sensor on this robot, and they used to, to pick up a tofu, you know, it can control the pressure um, on this robot arm. Then uh, it can pick up the tofu without any damage. On the other hand, without a pressure sensor installed, uh, it can only go with the position of the robot arm. So it's very difficult to uh, control the force or or the pickup force applied to the robot arm without damaging the tofu. So this um, can uh, uh, de be developed into many smart applications. Uh, so this is the pressure sensor we are working on. And the other technology we're working on, we also work on temperature sensor, uh, the mainly using our flexible batteries for temperature sensor applications. Uh, temperature sensor is uh, a very, you know, common instrument to, uh, in our daily life. Uh, but normally, it use uh, it will require parents or health care, uh, you know, doctors, nurse to uh, take temperature at a different time. So um, 
we are thinking of continuously monitoring the temperature for a patient or for uh, other necessary scenarios. Uh, so we uh, develop a, a temperature patch for continuously monitoring for you know kids for uh, um, you know, hospital application in hospital because uh, if nurse need to come during nighttime, they uh, continuously will uh, interrupt uh, the sleeping of uh, patient. And the currently right now for um, you know quarantine purpose, it's also will be more convenient if we have a continuous temperature measurement uh, monitoring uh, you know, device. So that's why we uh, try to develop. The temperature patch we develop is uh, completely flexible. So we use a high accuracy temperature sensor. It's uh, quite small, you know, a silicon based sensor. And we have flexible PCBs to go with it. Um, the data can be tra transmitted through Bluetooth to mobile device or, uh, or cloud. And uh, the other piece uh, is also developed by ourselves is a flexible battery. Uh, the battery can supply power to all the chips or the uh, sensors. And this battery is uh, quite flexible. So the whole patch is uh, flexible. So uh, it can, uh, we recommend it to place it under the arm with the sensor uh, you know, below the arm and the armpit, and then the um, the PCB and the Bluetooth part are sticking out for data uh, data you know better data transmissions. And uh, with this up, uh, this with this setup, we can uh, clearly see the, the um, data monitoring continuously data monitoring. So the data can be transmitted every minute or five minutes or even um, different uh, frequencies. Um, the uh, if you have more frequent data transmission, the battery life probably is a bit shorter. Um, if you have uh, less frequent data transmission, uh, it can the patch can uh, you know survive two weeks or so without any additional power. So, so this one uh, it can be used in hospital. You know, multiple uh, patient can they all the data in the in hospital ward can be transmitted directly to nurse station or to the doctor's computer directly uh, for their evaluation. It's very convenient. Uh, for kids with a continuous monitoring with this flexible temperature patch, you know, parents no need to wake up at night time to measure their temperature. If there's any over temperature or high temperature uh, developing uh, the uh, device, can give a warning signal to wake up a parents. So it will be more com uh, convenient. For quarantine, uh, of course, you can get a no contact measurement of temperature by using this device. So this uh, is uh, probably um, quite uh, useful for health monitoring uh, purpose. So this is a quick uh, introduction of our flexible temperature patch uh, developed in NAMI. Uh, it seems like I have a few minutes left, so I will uh, briefly introduce another sensor we are working on. Um, it's, uh, uh, it's for biological and the chemical uh, applications. So this is an electrical chemical sensor. It uses um, uh, some um, you know, enzyme as a receptor. Uh, for this type of sensor, it's mainly used for test the human samples. You know, it could be uh, related with blood, urine, sweat, or saliva, or tear, tears, and the analytes in these body fluid uh, include lots of uh, metabolites, proteins, ions, uh, DNA, or cells. So these can all be um, you know, traced by biosensors. Uh, such kind of sensor can also be used to detect or you know monitor food samples and the environmental samples, and uh, by, by applying this such kind of sensor structure, the key uh, is the bioreceptor attached to the sensor. So depends on, depending on the analytes, it will have a matching biomarker or bioreceptor to go with it. Uh, currently, you know, enzyme is a typical one for glucose analysis and many other analysis also. It can also um, use other biomarkers, including nucleic acids, antibody cells, and extra, uh, et cetera. So we mainly focusing on the uh, 
the, the selection of biomarkers and the development of transducers to convert the biological signal into electrical signals. So we currently working on electrochemical with amperometric method. So the biological signal is converted to a current that can be measured by device. And after uh, signal processing amplifications, uh, we can see uh, the signal to be displayed. You know, it can tell us the concentration of analytes to be measured. And uh, if you look at the current market right now, uh, in the market, uh, we mainly see two different types of uh, products. Uh, one is the laboratory instrument, which tends to be very sensitive, high performance, good repeatability. Uh, but the downside is it's a bit bulky and they normally need the expert users to operate it. And another type of uh, products in, available in the market is uh, sort of handheld device, such as uh, uh, many you know, people are using the glucose meters. Uh, it can be used by uh, you know, ordinary users uh, without uh, much experience. Uh, but the problem with that is, uh, you know, it, it has a compromised sensitivity and the selectivity. And the typically detection limit may not be that great. So as of now, when we check the market, currently it's mainly limited to glucose uh, detections. So by talking to many industrial partners, we can see um, there are certain requirements uh, for the next generation point of care device, which requires higher sensitivity and uh, selectivity for, for doctor's application, for, you know, for clinical applications. And also, uh, other than glucose, we also probably need to come up with device that can analyze other uh, analytes. And uh, for, um, for health monitoring, there's also certain requirements, you know, for those continuous monitoring device for healthcare, uh, mainly for physiological um, uh, monitoring. So, so uh, currently, those devices actually, uh, uh, you currently we are using uh, on mobile phone, uh, not uh, directly related with uh, human health. It's uh, typically is for ECG heart rate and stuff like that. So if we need to go beyond that, we have to go with the uh, biosensors to do so. Uh, we need to, you know, analyze uh, the analyte in saliva, sweat, or so for uh, for monitoring. And uh, also, it's probably need the requirement of simultaneous monitoring of uh, multi analytes. Uh, for instance, the lactates and the glucose and the ions and the pH levels or so. So this continuous monitoring potentially will be very useful. Uh, but in those body fluid, so, you know, the concentration of analytes typically is uh, quite low. So if we want to go toward that application, we have to come up with device that has very good sensitivity and is able to detect the low concentration of uh, analytes. So that's one of the reasons, you know, we try to develop some device that can uh, detect the low concentration of uh, analytes. If I take a glucose as a glucose sensor as an example, um, common device is the three electrodes uh, device in, uh, have a counter electrode, a reference electrode, and a working electrode. And there's an enzyme modification on working electrode to specifically select a uh, you know, response to uh, glucose. Or so if you have other analytes to be analyzed, uh, you can change it to other enzymes. For instance, if you want to detect alcohol, you can change it to alcohol oxidase instead of using glucose oxidase. So this the uh, principle of the operation. Um, by using such kind of uh, sensor structure, uh, typically the detection limit is uh, uh, quite uh, uh, you know limited in, to certain sensing range. For instance, for glucose, normally it can only detect um, glucose levels of above one millimolar or so. Uh, below that, it's not able to detect because of this sensor structure, you know, using a, a direct current from this electrode. 
So the fluidic current generated by such chemical reaction is a bit low if your analyte concentration is low. So um, in order to overcome this problem, uh, we have to come up with better sensor structures to detect those low concentration analytes in body, other body fluids. For instance, uh, for blood glucose, you know, it, normally it's in millimolar range, but in saliva tears or in uh, sweat, the concentration of glucose is in micromole, so it's a few orders lower, you know, 10 to 100 times lower. Then we have to use sensors with much better sensitivities. So that's uh, that's one of the reasons we uh, come up or trying to develop a sensor that is more capable of for monitoring low concentration of analytes. So instead of using a typical or common three electrode, electrical chemical sensors, uh, we uh, intended to use a transistor type of sensor. Uh, it still has three electrodes, but it has a gate electrode which is modified with enzyme materials for selective detection of analytes. But the other two electrodes is developed into source and drain, which is two electrodes in a transistor uh, type of device. And uh, between these two electrodes, we have uh, a channel materials placed uh, between source and the drain. So by using such kind of structure, actually the transistor has a amplification effect. So the small current normally cannot be detected earlier with this working electrode in the uh, common device. Um, by using a transistor, you know, the, end of the electrolyte uh, can, the signal over here can, you know, the, um, the ions accumulated on the gate electrode will, uh, will generate a, a, a potential difference. The potential difference, then it can uh, let the ions in the electrolyte to move toward this channel area. And the change, uh, if it moves into the channel material, it can combine with the holes, which is the carrier uh, inside the channel. So it will in uh, change its uh, conductivity. When this conductivity is changed, a large current will form between the source and the drain. So when you have a potential applied to source and the drain electrode, a small change in concentration will cause a large current flow between this source and the drain. So essentially, you can detect a very small uh, concentration of analytes in the electrolyte and get a very decent signal uh, by measuring source and the drain current. Uh, this is a typical you know, um, pattern you can see. Um, by applying a potential over here, um, a very uh, high or very reasonable current can be uh, changed, can be seen for low concentration of analytes. For instance, even like a one, less than 100 nanomolar or even 10 nanomolar of uh, concentration can change can be seen. So in this way, we can use this sensor structure to detect many things. Glucose is one of uh, it, but it can also be used to detect many uh, low concentrations uh, analytes related with human samples or even uh, food samples or even you know, air or water or soil samples to form many applications. So if you look at it, 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 it's, it's suitable for health monitoring, it's suitable for physiological monitoring, as well as many other applications, uh, including the toxin detection, uh, environmental monitoring, uh, food quality monitoring, and, uh, and stuff like that. And uh, since the transistor itself is quite small, you know, we can manufacture or fabricate uh, multiple sensors on the same device, and then it can be used for uh, analysis of multiple analytes uh, for both biological and uh, um, uh, chemical applications. So um, that's, I will stop here. That's uh, the introduction of uh, sensing technology here in NAMI. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Fu. Uh, very interesting uh, studies, and uh, thank you for bringing us this uh, uh, you know, new information that I think uh, are very exciting to uh, a lot of us. Um, I think the now the session is open for questions. So if you have any question, you can leave a message in the chat, or uh, you want to open the mic and ask questions. That's also fine. So maybe I can um, ask a question to begin with, like for the pressure and temperature uh, sensors that you mentioned, uh, I think those are really, really promising. Uh, I'm just wondering whether uh, those sensors have been tested under some, um, you know, extreme conditions like uh, radiation or magnets, or can they be used under those conditions? Uh, we tested under higher temperature, for instance, around uh, um, 150 degrees C or so. Uh, for temperature higher than that, we don't recommend it because the substrate normally is a plastic foil, so it will have some problem reliability issues if you go beyond that. Uh, more extreme conditions, for, for instance, what you mentioned, the radiation also, uh, we haven't tested, but we expect radiation should not be a problem because the material itself you know, determines uh, it should function normally during those conditions. Okay, all right, great, thank you. It's very good to hear that because um, uh -huh. my all interest in area is radiation therapy for cancer patients, so thank yeah. you. Uh, so we do have a question in the chat. Would you like to, uh, a couple of questions. Would you like to take a look and uh, Okay, okay, let questions. me take a look. The first question, what is the process the research project should proceed for seeking the collaboration and the technical advice from NAMI team? Um, normally, if we have a technology, we will propose to uh, interested industrial partners. For instance, for pressure sensor, uh, we are partnering with Dr. Kong and some other uh, parties, you know, try to develop and promote our technologies. So Dr. Kong right now is trying to scale up the fabrication or the manufacturing of the sensor device for their own use. And... Uh, um, you know, others, um, you know, users, like for instance, Dr. Ma, if uh, she has certain, you know, clinical trial applications that can utilize our, our device or so, you know, they are all welcome to contact us, you know. Uh, certain of the technology are quite, uh, you know, well developed right now for those pressure sensors. And uh, we welcome all the applications. Uh, inquiry. Um, so the next one it will be, can pressure sensor be changed to transistor structure? Um, to enlarge pressure signal? Uh, no, because the pressure sensor itself, the working principle is a bit different. So it's not, it, and, you know, it depends on those uh, electrical chemical uh, signals, as I mentioned in the EC sensor uh, uh, you know, applications. And uh, plus, uh, for the pressure sensor applications, we have to consider the uh, cost when uh, the application is developing. Currently, the printing method is uh, quite simple and uh, low cost. So if we change it to a more advanced, like transistor structures or so, it may not meet the requirement for certain application uh, due to the cost issue. Hi, right, thank you, Dr. Fu. Uh, I saw uh, Professor Tao was um, there. Um, just wondering whether you have questions. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I was trying to type something. Now, uh -oh. for, for your pressure sensor, uh, that was very interesting talk, uh, uh, Dr. Fu. And uh, I just wonder for pressure sensor, uh, whether uh, stress relaxation would be a problem if you measure a long-term standing uh, pressure. Uh, very good question. We actually have uh, different kinds of testing because of uh, time limit. I didn't put it here. We have like a drifting. For instance, one person uh, continuously step on the same 
area on the same sensor array and continuously for 48 hours or even longer and what's the signal change. So the drifting is very minimal. That means the change is less than 5% uh, for a very extended period. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. There's another question on the chat. So the next question is, what is the smallest size of the uh, thermal sensor? Um, the sensor itself is quite small, like a one millimeter or so. Uh, but when we include the PCBs, the batteries, um, it's measuring probably about 2 cm by 10 cm or so, the whole patch, including the flexible battery, the PCBs or so. Um, the question is, NAMI can produce currently in the how about the maximum battery capacity if the sample rate is uh, decreased? Um, <clears throat> we currently have the technology, but it should be quite easy to produce if we have in industrial partners. So we're not, uh, we are not producing it because NAMI is simply not a manufacturer. So we are technology developer. Um, the maximum battery uh, depends on your requirement. If you need a very flex uh, flexible, uh, we have uh, small batteries and the thinner batteries. So currently, if we have uh, one layer batteries, it can support uh, two weeks of continuous operation with a frequency of about um, five, sec uh, five minutes per you know, transmission. Oh, okay. Um, do you want to quickly uh, answer that last question? Yeah. So the last question is, can ECT sensors measure stress indicators like dopamine? Yeah, that's one area we are trying to develop. You know, uh, dopamine uh, is a very useful. You know, originally we are trying to develop a glucose sensor, uh, but ends up after talking to industrial partners, you know, glucose sensor, it's uh, quite difficult to, to get into the market because it's uh, there's a well-established manufacturers out there. And also uh, the correlation between sweat, saliva, you know, glucose is probably quite different or not confirmed with the blood glucose. So that's why after talking to, you know, a certain uh, partners or industrial uh, companies, uh, we decided that probably glucose sensor is not a good area to start with. So we are currently looking into dopamine and other analytes. Hey, all right, thank you, Dr. Fu, again. Once again, thank you uh, for your excellent talk. Or talk yeah. To you. Okay. yeah, thank and, you. So last but not least, uh, Dr. Mike Merchant. Hello, Mike. Sorry uh, for the late, and thank you for your patience. So uh, Dr. Mike uh, Merchant is currently a senior lecturer in proton therapy physics in the uh, precise group and at the Division of Cancer Sciences, University of Manchester. He received a PhD in electronic engineering from the University of Surrey, and his primary research interest is the uh, development of biologically augmented treatment planning for proton therapy based on anode symmetry and me uh, uh, mechanistic modeling of DNA repair. And today, uh, he actually brings us a very interesting uh, topic, which is uh, Ingrid's study in the monitoring for better recovery and cancer experience, a radiotherapy perspective. So I personally am very interested in uh, this topic. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Uh, Merchant. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, I hope you can all see my slides now. Yes. Great, okay. So um, I'm gonna talk today about uh, radiation therapy, in particular proton therapy. And my talk is in two parts. Really the first part is about uh, proton therapy and radiobiological uncertainty, really working from the DNA scale up to the cell scale. And the second part of my talk is gonna work in the other direction, talking about how we can measure the effects of proton therapy and radiation therapy uh, through looking at what the, uh, the, the patient response, in particular the EMBRACE trial on patient recovery, um, and really linking those two effects from different, um, different viewpoints is how we can understand uh, how we can improve proton therapy. So um, I'm, I'm from the University of Manchester, uh, we were the first uh, National Health Service um, funded uh, proton therapy centre in the UK here in Manchester. Um, 
and uh, I've shown it uh, here uh, at night because uh, I'm an academic, not a clinician, and we have a, a research lab in the, uh, the National Health Service Proton Therapy Centre in Manchester. Now there's one in Manchester and one in London, but we can actually only do our research at night once the, uh, the patient treatments have finished. So uh, it was appropriate to show the, uh, the picture at night. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to give a very brief overview of protons, really to build up the picture of why or where wearables can play a part in understanding radiation therapy. So the best thing about protons compared to conventional radiotherapy using x-rays is that they stop. So on this uh, figure, I've shown with the uh, red line, the type of radiation dose with depth that you would depth into a patient, you would get with photons. So that's conventional radiotherapy. So you can see that you have a, a short buildup region, uh, which scares, uh, spares the skin a little bit, but it, it builds up quickly. And then you have an exponential decay of dose uh, as that X-ray beam uh, traverses the patient. So if you have a tumor at some depth into the patient, you have this high entrance dose and then some exit dose uh, beyond the tumor. And any of this radiation dose that occurs in uh, normal healthy tissue has a chance of um, ad very adverse side effects in the patient, uh, perhaps impairing their quality of life, or perhaps um, inducing a secondary cancer at some later time point after their treatment, which may then become a, a new cancer. Um, so, uh, so very unfortunate side effects. And really the goal of radiotherapy is to minimize these. Now with protons uh, in the dark blue lines have shown um, the individual proton brag peak. So uh, a proton rapidly loses energy as it slows down. So by tuning the energy from the accelerator, we can tune the depth that it travels to match with the tumor. And by building up several beams of different energies, we can get what's called a spread out Bragg peak, which is a, uh, a flat top of that radiation dose that matches the tumor location. There obviously is so, still some entrance dose as we get those beams to the tumor, but there's absolutely no dose beyond the tumor. So the advantage of protons is that we spare those organs at risk that may be beyond the tumor. The caveat to that is that we've, we've based all our understanding of how many cells or how many tumor cells or how many healthy cells that protons kill on our uh, understanding of conventional radiation therapy using photons. Now, really, we've been radiating patients with photons for almost 100 years now. So we've got a lot of clinical evidence of exactly what dose is needed to sterilize what type of tumor and what are the risk factors in different healthy tissues for a given dose. But with protons, because they're, um, they're actually particles, their radiation damage in, uh, in DNA is quite different to conventional radiotherapy, it's not entirely understood how they kill cells um, or, well, how the, the different type of DNA damage they do leads to different levels of toxicity. So on this figure on the right, I've shown something that we call RBE, that's the relative biological effect of protons. So it's a simple ratio of how many cells protons kill for a given dose com compared to how many cells conventional radiotherapy using x-rays would kill. Um, and I've shown the data here uh, from a paper from Harold Pagnetti uh, published in 2014. Uh, we've replotted it for various different uh, linear energy transfers. So the linear energy transfer of the proton increases as the proton slows down. So this x-axis scale on left to right, you could think really is on the around zero, the very high energy proton entering the patient. And at the end of range, about 15 kV per micron, those, that's those protons really stopping in the patient, stopping in the tumor and doing their maximum damage, transferring their maximum linear energy. Um, and we've plotted it for several different cell lines. And what you'll see really is that there's a huge amount of uncertainty. Now in uh, small animal data sets, uh, we see a, a proton relative biological effect 
of about 1.1, meaning that protons are 110% more toxic than, um, than X-rays. And this is what's used clinically almost everywhere in the world for clinical proton therapy treatment. We take the, uh, the conventional dose that we'd know about with X-rays, and we use a factor of 1.1 to convert that to the proton dose that we should use. But you will see that this data is very largely scattered. And in vitro, uh, in, in plastic studies, in uh, single cell lines, we see that the RBE, the relative biological effect of protons, almost certainly increases and maybe as high as 1.7 when the protons are coming to the end of range when they're stopping. The problem is this is very hard to quantify and the normal way is using a, a clonogenic assay which measures the amount of surviving cells in plastic after irradiation but this has not proved very accurate over a number of studies really over the last 60 years. So um, there's a lot of work into trying to build mathematical models of how this effect can be quantified. And I'm going to talk briefly about my work in this area and the work of my team, but I'm really going to leave out a lot of the work using analytical approaches. So I just want you to be aware that I'm not presenting all of the work in this area. Now, there's a huge range of things that affect proton uh, relative biological effect. And that's why it has been difficult to quantify. It's things like the energy of the protons, the dose, the dose rate has become particularly important in recent years, uh, the fractionation pattern, the energy transfer, all of those are kind of on the physics side. But on the biology side, there's also the, um, the individual radio sensitivity of the patient, how well oxygenated those cells are, what phase of their cell cycle they're in when they're irradiated, um, the particular environment of the cancer, um, particularly in terms of hypoxia, which is a measurement of oxygenation. And then, of course, the individual lab to lab variation in trying to measure these effects. So I'm very fortunate in that I have a, uh, a lab in the clinical uh, proton therapy center in Manchester at the Christie Hospital. We have uh, three clinical uh, treatment rooms, which are, are shown in red on this diagram. So we have the, uh, the 250 MeV uh, ProBeam cyclotron by Varian Medical Systems. And then we have three clinical gantries. And in our fourth room, we have a, uh, a room that is just for research. It's not for treating patients. Um, and we have built a, uh, a research beam line in this space um, for, well, for research. And here it is. So uh, the beam comes through from left to right, is focused by a number of magnetic quadrupole triplets, and then it goes into this engineering scanning nozzle, uh, which is identical to the, uh, the scanning nozzle that's used in the clinical uh, treatment rooms. So although we don't have a beam that can rotate around the patient, we position our radiobiological samples in front of this beam line, and it's far easier to rotate the samples for us than it would be to rotate the beam because these magnets weigh about seven tons. You require a huge amount of, um, of current to power the magnets to, to deflect the beam. So this magnet here weighs about uh, seven tons and that can scan the beam over an area of 40 centimeters by 30 centimeters, which matches the, uh, the same parameters as the clinical system, but for our research beam line. And our, our beam spot is about the size of a, uh, a marble. Um, or, you know, a little bit smaller than the golf ball. And at the end of our beam line, we have these research end stations. So this is a removable modular end station where we can irradiate cells under hypoxia uh, with a high degree of automation. And so uh, that allows us to get quite a high throughput because we can't be in the laboratory when the beam is on due to the radiation risk. So I've got a short video of what that looks like in practice. So we worked with a, uh, a company called Don Whitley Scientific that are based in Yorkshire in England uh, to develop the first hypoxia cabinet that can have a proton beam fired all the way through it. And because we work at night, we want to minimize the, uh, the risk of human error and get maximum throughput from our experiments to reduce that uh, biological or statistical error that I showed previously on the, uh, on the data. So we've developed a robotic arm system 
that can pick up a, uh, a 96 well plate or a T25 flask from what we call our hotel. We can house 36 samples here. And this is all fully automated from our control room. So the, uh, the robot can pick up a sample, place it in front of this vacuum window, which allows the proton beam to come through at the back of the cabinet, irradiate it, and then put the sample into our liquid handling robot. Uh, it can then delid the sample and it can add a number of different fixative agents. It's got four liquid channels. So our normal uh, experiment would be to add formalin, which freezes the cells in their exact um, chemical state at the, uh, at the time point in which the chemical is added. And we can then extract those cells at a later time point and go and look at them under a microscope to look for markers of DNA damage, cell survival, anything that we can stain for really using a microscope. And this whole environment can be uh, controlled for temperature, uh, oxygenation, CO2. And so this is how the majority of our experiments now happen. So my work is in trying to build mathematical models of how DNA damage and repair happens and whether we can use these mathematical models to better understand or better predict that proton relative biological effect and how it changes with depth into the patient. So we use um, a computational code developed at CERN called Geant4, which tracks the trajectories of particles and all of their interactions that they undergo on their passage through materials. And within this code, we build models of, uh, of the DNA, of chromatin fibers, and then of the cell, uh, the cell and the cell nucleus, placing these DNA structures within the cell. And then we uh, use the code to uh, simulate a radiation of these structures and look at how many double strand breaks we get. So, so this is a break on opposite strands of the DNA uh, made by radiation but within sufficient proximity that those breaks on opposite strands can cause the DNA to separate and then need repair. And we look particularly at the structure of those breaks. So here's a, um, a simulation of what that would look like, really just a, a quick animation to make this a little bit more visual, showing uh, the passage of a single proton in green through a, uh, a chromatin fiber. So you're looking at quite a long chain um, you're looking at it top down, so it just appears like a spiral. And you can see uh, in these regions where the DNA is going to be wrapped around uh, nucleosomes. So wherever the green line uh, travels through any of these base or backbone volumes in the DNA, we can score a break. The red lines show uh, secondary electrons, uh, which come off the, uh, the proton, wherever it interacts with liquid water in the cell. And then the, uh, the multicolored trajectories represent the, the chemistry. So where uh, oxygen radicals are produced and really wherever any one of these single tracks interacts with a base or backbone volume, we can score some damage. And then we can look at where that's clustered to see if that relates to a, uh, a double strand break. And we can fit that against literature data, particularly for x-rays to look at how the structure of that damage or how the, um, fraction of uh, direct to chemical damage changes. So uh, what does this look like in terms of a, uh, a Bragg peak? Um, so this was some work we looked at earlier in the year. Um, this is on, well, on the top panel of these three graphs, we've got the simple physical dose. So this is simply joules per kilogram, which we know is gray in a, a spread out Bragg peak up to about um, 16 centimeters depth. Uh, we've used 10 beams to make a, a flat spread out Bragg peak uh, across the tumor region here. And in the dotted black line, you can see how the LET, the linear energy transfer of the protons, uh, it goes asymptotic as we reach the end of range. And then at this point, we run out of particles that travel this far, so we've got no real data, but this would become um, increased. If we look at that in terms of uh, the simple DNA damage, so this is a simple um, double strand break just involving two backbone regions, we can see that simple damage dominates. But if we look at complex damage where we involve two or more backbone regions and possibly a base volume as well, we can see that um, we've got quite a low level 
of complex damage throughout this spread out Bragg Peak. Now on the third panel at the bottom, what's particularly interesting is that the ratio of these damages shown in the black line from simple to complex increases dramatically towards the end of range. So this could potentially uh, be a, a difference in the mode of cell death, where cells respond differently to complex damage compared to simple damage um, when they try to repair that, dam that, that DNA damage. So uh, I'll talk briefly about Damaris, which is our DNA mechanistic repair simulator that we developed in Manchester. This is again an in silico model that takes the, uh, the damage to DNA that I've shown on the previous slide and attempts to repair it to predict cell fate. So again, this is simply uh, studying the, well, the DNA model. Um, it doesn't look at uh, tissue level responses, but it looks at individual repair proteins and how they attach to that damaged site, um, looking at what their chance of success is and the timing of how likely they are and how quickly they attach for two different repair pathways, non-homologous end joining and homologous recombination. And at the end of this um, sequence of events, it tries to look at whether they've been repaired by either pathway or whether they failed. Now there's two different things that can happen here. Uh, either they can, um, they can correctly repair, or they can uh, do something that's called misrepair, which is where they, uh, they do complete repair, but if there's two or more double strand breaks in close proximity, they can join the wrong ends of those breaks and create a chromosome aberration. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in, uh, in the next few slides. And of course, they can completely fail to repair, and that would result in a, uh, a double strand break that was left over. And that's also a toxic event to the cell. So we call that a residual break. And we can fit this repair model to, uh, to data from literature for all sorts of different endpoints, each of the uh, recruitment kinetics of those different DNA repair proteins or the overall residual double strand breaks that are left in the simulation. And most of this comes from microscopy data. So uh, really this slide is just to highlight how we've achieved a, uh, a fit to a variety of experiments in the literature using our uh, mathematical model. So talking about those potential different fates, I like this uh, particular figure from uh, Lucas and Cornforth, which shows the, um, the possibility of chromosome aberrations. So uh, if you imagine that we've got four different strands of DNA all in quite close proximity, uh, the blue, the yellow, the green, and the red. And our proton radiation creates four separate double strand breaks in each of these strands. Now you can see that once repair happens, the, uh, the blue strand misrepairs with the yellow strand, the yellow strand misrepairs with the green strand, the green strand misrepairs with the red strand, and then what we have left is these two broken strands in the blue and the red, um, which uh, the, the blue um, spherical areas represent the probable um, diffusion radius of each of these strands, indicating that the blue strand, the broken uh, end on the blue strand, will never now diffuse far enough to meet the broken end on the red strand. So we've got three misrepair events and then two residual uh, double strand break events left over, where these breaks will never appear. So both of these types of, um, of damage are, are critical in the cell fate and probably both will lead to uh, cell death. And we call this um, repair fidelity. However, in our mathematical models, it's quite easy to pre predict the, uh, the instance of misrepair but misrepair represents the whole spectrum of different chromosome aberrations. And it's difficult to know exactly how toxic these misrepair events are. Some could be very complex exchanges and others could just be simple, very small deletions in DNA in areas of the DNA that aren't particularly important. They're not involved in DNA repair or cell maintenance. And so actually they're probably quite survivable. So what we need is a very accurate model of the cell nucleus to understand where those DNA breaks happen. And we've used data from a number of different labs uh, worldwide, which is called HiC. 
uh, which is a technique of mapping genome or gene to gene interactions um, and their probability of occurring. And it's actually exactly what we need. So it gives us this spatial correlation. And we can use that with, um, with map, well, with knowledge of the, uh, the size of genes in the human genome to try and rebuild a spatial model of the cell nucleus. So this is a, uh, a mathematical model we've developed in Manchester, which I like to think of as the, the world's best game of Tetris. It uses that high C data and then uses a numerical solver to try and pack the whole of the human, human genome back into a space of the cell nucleus using an optimization function that was related on the, the size of the genome. And if I, uh, I run that again, you can see that it starts off with all of these genes uh, being well spaced out and it uses a different number of different operations to try and pack it back together using the high C data to give a higher score when the genes that are supposed to be close to each other are close to each other. And we can do this for a number of different cell types. And also we can run the simulation thousands of times because there's many different or, or many different solutions to this problem. So for each of these different cell lines, uh, normal human fibroblasts, normal lymphocytes, um, or uh, well, normal um, uh, dermal endothelium cells, we can do it for cancer cells as well. Uh, we can generate these models of the cell nucleus. And then we can run our uh, radiation model through them in Giant 4 and look at where the breaks occurred and particularly where misrepair events happen between different colors in this model, which represent different, uh, different chromosomes. And in that way, we can build up a model of chromosome aberrations. So uh, that's, the, that's the kind of the theory of the mathematical model. How does it translate into practice? Well, this is a, uh, a treatment plan for a, uh, a patient, uh, a teenage young adult patient who had uh, an ependymoma cancer and they were uh, planned, their treatment was planned at the Christie, but it was before our, um, our proton therapy center was built. So we actually sent them to the States for treatment. And so on the left hand side, you can see the absorbed dose that correlates with the tumor region. And this is um, this is simple dose in joules per kilogram or in gray, uh, overlaid on a, a CT scan of the patient. And in this particular treatment, there was actually three fields of radiation. So the beam was uh, irradiated the patient from three different directions. One went into the page, uh, one came out of the page towards us, and the other came from the top of the cranium towards the tumor. And this is more obviously shown on the, uh, the right hand side where we have the, uh, the linear energy transfer map. So if you remember the linear energy transfer, the amount of energy a proton deposits per uh, unit volume, that increases as the protons slow down. So we actually see a slight increase here at the, uh, the end of the range for the, the beam that comes from the top of the cranium. And perhaps a little bit of concern is that we have this high um, or higher uh, LET, um, overlapping with the, uh, the end of the brainstem, um, unavoidable in this treatment, but that would come up with a uh, increased risk of, uh, well, of, of toxicity or complexities in the treatment for the, the particular patient. Now, if we use our mathematical models, on the left-hand side, I've shown the, uh, the, the damage simulation. So that's just predicting the, uh, the uh, the structure of the double strand breaks, as I showed earlier. And on the right hand side, I've shown that physics, that DNA damage model, but then we've applied the repair model to it. So actually, you see that it's not particularly different, the absorbed dose plan. It, on this level, it doesn't look very different. You see a lot more simple breaks than you do complex breaks. And you see a lot more residual double strand breaks. These are double strand breaks that will never repair then you do uh, misrepair events. So no particular surprise. If we look at that at one more level and we look at the RBE, so this is compared, comparing the proton treatment to what we get with conventional radiotherapy based on these simulations. So that's using X-rays. What gets a little bit more interesting is like the LET, 
the ratio, the RBE of complex damage increases at the end of range for that beam coming from the, uh, the top of the cranium. And it potentially goes up as high as 1.3, 1.35 at the end of range. So that matches some of the uh, in, in, in vitro experiments on single cell lines, um, simply for the, the DNA damage. In terms of the uh, applying the repair model, which of course we need to do if we want to actually match this to, uh, to experiment, um, we can see that the, the residual damage, about the same scale expected, up to about 1.3 on the color bar. Now I'll highlight that the color bar scales are particularly different here. Uh, on the misrepair scale, it goes as high as 16. So this really would represent a difference in repair mode at the end of range. Okay, so how does all this translate to wearables? I'm gonna spend the next few minutes talking about the Embrace project. So this is enhanced monitoring for better recovery and cancer experience in Greater Manchester. So the link is that we have these mathematical models of how protons kill cells, but it's very hard for us to actually relate this to patient data. Easy to measure in cells, but difficult to measure in patients. There's a number of other techniques such as using uh, medical imaging um, or using clinical assessments, um, but so far they, they very difficult to correlate over the very long term of cancer side effects. It can take up to 10 years to develop. So my hope is that wearables will fill this space and give us more quantitative data than something like PROMS where uh, only say a 10 point Likert scale is used. So PROMS is patient recorded outcome measures where only a 10 point scale is used to assess the, uh, the patient outcome. So the EMBRACE project, um, started by trying to study patients for uh, 24 hours a day using continuous monitoring, um, using commercially available wearable devices. And when we discussed this with patients, they were, uh, they were very keen on this idea. A number of their concerns were that they experience cancer for 24 hours a day, but currently they only really have um, monitoring with clinicians when they visit the clinic. So, it, they, they don't feel like they're being monitored all the time. One of the things that came out of our patient group is that fatigue is particularly important to patients. And it's one of the things that's not particularly well followed up at the moment. Um, and there's a bit of a gap between uh, the hospital when they speak to their cancer clinician and their, uh, their GP. Um, and equally, the, the psychological support um, was something that they had identified that they'd have liked to have had more of. Um, so particularly the challenge was that there's this massive gap between GP and hospital care. And to close that gap, what we need is real world data. And where wearables could fill this gap is monitoring sleep, activity levels, vital signs, heart rate variability, and symptom reporting. And so what we're gonna look for in EMBRACE in particular is recovery after cancer treatment. So whether there's digital phenotypes as we call them of recovery. So can we use wearables to look for particular markers that indicate whether a patient is recovering well from their cancer treatment or whether they're gonna going struggle with that recovery and we should modify or stratify the cancer intervention based on the wearable data of the patient. So the aims are, can we use commercially available vital signs monitors that would provide useful data during patient, uh, during treatment? Are there, are devices, are there devices that are acceptable to patients? Will they wear them for the duration of the trial? Is the data that we achieve or, or receive from where, uh, commercially available wearable devices, is it useful? Does it link back to, um, the, uh, the treatment data. And importantly, will healthcare professionals know what to do with this very uh, data-rich, continuously available data? Um, at the moment, there's really no uh, medical professionals uh, in the UK who've been, or certainly in cancer, 
who uh, have had any particular training in what to do with uh, wearables data um, from, from cancer patients. It's not something that we know a great deal about. So in Embrace, we've chosen to use two different types of, uh, of wearables to see which one is the most acceptable to patients. Um, and we're going to look at three different uh, cancer groups. They are um, lung cancer patients, colorectal cancer patients, and lymphoma patients uh, over a range of different modalities using surgery, radiotherapy, and CAR T cell therapy for the lymphoma patients. So our two wearable devices are a, uh, a ring type device, which is the, uh, the Aura ring, and then a watch type device. So they're quite physically different. And from our patient involvement groups, the patients so far have indicated that they're probably more happy to wear a ring overnight and may not be as happy to wear a, uh, a watch. So uh, we would expect by the end of our study um, that we're gonna have less engagement with the watch type device. So our aura, aura ring, it can measure activity levels. Um, it has an indication of uh, the number of calories through the number, well, through the type of activity. It can measure steps, inactive times, the number of naps taken, um, but it's actually uh, likely to be better at measuring sleep than the watch device. In particular, it's, uh, it can measure heart rate, heart rate variability, respiratory rate, temperature, um, the type and the structure of the sleep, the amount of movement, and of course, sleep timing. In contrast, the watch device, the Withings Scan Watch, is much more um, of an active measurement device. So more likely to measure patient's exercise. Uh, it can measure oxygen saturation. It has a SpO2 monitor. Um, it's, uh, it can measure VO2 max, and then all the normal things like the type of walking, running, steps. Importantly, it can also do an uh, electrocardiogram, so a, a single point ECG, and that has been medically um, validated. Although most of these devices, or both of these devices, are much more in the commercially available um, rather than medically validated clinical wearable um, domain. So what our trial looks like, this is an example just from the colorectal cohort. So we're giving these devices to uh, 40 patients um, and we're gonna study them for six months. So they have continuous monitoring, both with the Aura Ring and the Whipping Scan Watch. We have a, uh, a research support nurse who helps them set up these devices at the beginning of the trial. They're taught how to charge them and their interaction is via a, uh, an app for both devices on their mobile phone. So they can see and engage with all the data, but we also anonymously collect that. Um, so that's continuous monitoring. Now, during the study, we, uh, we also, via the, uh, the uh, mobile phone app, we, uh, we asked them uh, patient recorded outcome measure questionnaires using the, uh, the FACT uh, L or C uh, study or uh, the visual analog scale for fatigue. I'm particularly interested in radiation-induced fatigue, and I'll speak more about that in a moment. So fatigue um, is one of the most common side effects of cancer and cancer treatment. And it's actually seen in 90% of patients who are treated with radiotherapy or uh, chemotherapy. But it's very subjective and it can persist for a very long amount of time, up to 10 years, even in uh, disease free survivors. So in our patient support group, this was what the patients told us that they really, really wanted us to look into with wearable devices. Now, the problem with radiation induced fatigue is the mechanism is not well understood at all. In fact, all, almost all of our understanding of radiation induced fatigue or cancer related fatigue comes from uh, understanding of other um, fatigue related diseases such as chronic fatigue syndrome. Now what I want to do is see if we can use the wearables data to relate that back to where the dose went in the patients in the, uh, a style similar to using the, uh, the treatment maps that I showed earlier in my presentation. 
and whether we can use that to try and understand the mechanisms that induce radiation, uh, radiation induced fatigue, and if that's different to general cancer related fatigue from surgery or chemotherapy. Now, there is some evidence that this uh, is possible. I'm showing data here from the um, from the passport study that was done by uh, a different group published in 2012, where they showed that actually dose to the cerebellum um, correlated with an increased experience of fatigue um, when they measured that via uh, PROMS, but they didn't quite have enough data or enough data granularity to uh, build this into a mechanistic study or to try and quantify this into a risk estimate for that particular um, organ within the patient. So my hope is that the wearables data will provide that granular data that will allow us to uh, refine these risk estimates, the different structures within the patient. So we've developed a, uh, a platform for doing uh, clinical trials using wearables in Greater Manchester. So we're working with two companies. The first is Aptus Clinical, and they're an expert in clinical trials databases. So using this, we, uh, we import the patient's uh, routinely collected uh, healthcare data from their, uh, their medical record, their, uh, their GP record. And then we also uh, have a, uh, a software platform that incorporates data of the type of uh, cancer treatment they've received at uh, hospitals in Greater Manchester, including the Christie. So particularly for radiotherapy, this includes their, uh, the amount of radiation dose they've received, which contours that radiation dose has gone in. By that, I mean, whether it's within the tumor or whether it's in organs at risk close to the tumor and how many fractions of radiotherapy they've received. So there's some quite detailed data in there. Now that Aptus database transfers data into a database uh, that's held by Zensium, which is again a Manchester-based company with expertise in wearables and AI analysis. So that uh, calls on all the data from the, uh, the, um, the Aura Ring or the Withing Scan Watch. And again, those PROMs that measure um, simple measures of the cancer experience, um, following treatment or how fatigued the patients are. And we've developed this as a, a modular platform so it can be adapted to suit many different trials. So our trial uh, opened in December, 2021. Uh, it's gonna run for six months. There's a picture here of our, uh, our first patient who was recruited. So we're recruiting receiving data at the moment. Um, so uh, very, very pleased about that. And part of the follow-up from this, as well as that analysis of that feasibility study, do patients engage with the data? Can we use it to correlate against the treatments? We're also gonna run a healthcare professionals focus group to try and understand how healthcare professionals will integrate with this data, how they will understand it, what they would want to get from it. So we think of this as a very important part of the study. So uh, just coming up to the end of the hour, uh, these are, are my thanks to the, uh, the team in uh, Precise and in Grace. And um, thank you for your time. And I'm happy to take any questions. Right, uh, Dr. Merchant, thank you very much. I think uh, your uh, presentation today really demonstrated the uh, wide spectrum of the applications of uh, wearable electronics, you know, in different kinds of disease. Uh, uh, in cancer treatment, I think this is very new. I, I haven't seen uh, uh, wearable uh, clinical trials on, you know, uh, cancer treatment before, and using the most advanced technology, uh, proton therapy. So I think uh, this is a great uh, initiative. So uh, maybe I can start with a question and see, um, you know, other audience will. Uh, uh, ask other questions later. So just wondering, uh, in your trial, um, so first of all, how, how many patients will be enrolled total? 120 over the three different disease groups. So that's lung cancer, colorectal cancer, mm -hmm. and lymphoma over the three different modalities. 
I, okay. I appreciate that that is a relatively small number for this type of trial, but mm. really our, our first stage of embrace is to understand the acceptability of these devices to patients. And then we'll look to follow up with embrace two, which would be a more of an intervention based trial. Mm -hmm. yeah, so you have the, uh, the workflow showing the uh, duration and after uh, routine therapy, you have continuous monitoring. Um, so post the treatment, there will be only one measurement or are you can actually have them wearing the electronics for a rather long time, like, like even years? Yes, absolutely. So at the moment, um, they're given the devices or they're recruited to the study at the start of their treatment. So at their first clinical appointment. So then they have the devices continuously through their treatment, whether that's surgery, uh, radiotherapy, uh, chemo radiotherapy or CAR T cell therapy. And then they have them continuously for up to six months. Um, so that's what we have ethics for at the moment, um, continuously up to six months. If the patients are willing to continue wearing those devices um, after the six months, we'll look to continue that if the data looks useful beyond that period. Any particular considerations when you uh, register the patients, like you know, which type of patients that you think will you know benefit the study or benefit the patient? Well, at, at the moment, it's um, it's all patients receiving um, a, a treatment with a curative intent. Um, so we're looking to really particularly in lung to get the, the, the whole spectrum of patients, whether they go for surgery or radiotherapy. It's a relatively small amount proportion of patients who go for radiotherapy alone. But one thing that we have found that is particularly a concern is um, digital or uh, digital inequalities. Uh, a number of our patients in Greater Manchester come from um, areas with, uh, with deprivation where they may not have high quality access to internet or uh, education about using um, digital devices. And so that has been um, one of our concerns. And so as part of the trial, we did actually set up a 24 hour um, health helpline where the patients at any point they can phone our research support nurse uh, because we did find that there is um, considerable anxiety about the the data that patients see when they see a, a trend in their data and they don't know what to do with it and their GP doesn't know what to do with it because they've no experience with wearables data before and actually you know really this is our first trial in wearables in cancer so at the moment, we don't really know what to do with the data or, or what it, um, you know, what a urgent bad result would uh, look like. So at the moment, our patients are advised that if they are uh, concerned in any way, they should go directly to accident and emergency. And that's part of our, um, our ethics, because, you know, we, we at the moment, there, there is no real evidence to support you know, what you should do with this data. And that's part of what we hope to uh, achieve. I think this first-hand uh, information will be very helpful moving forward with a larger cohort, okay? Thank you, thank you very much. Um, any questions from the floor? Okay, so if you know, uh, in view of the time, I thank all the you know speakers, uh, Dr. Ma, Dr. Fu, and Dr. Merchant for all of your excellent uh, speeches today. We really appreciate, and I think we learned quite a bit from the different aspects uh, in you know healthcare applications for the wearable electronics. Thank you very much, and thank you all audience for staying uh, late. Thank you for your patience. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye, bye, everyone. Bye, bye.